All right. Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to be going over the March releases for all the applications. Hopefully, you can see my screen on the main wiki page. I'm going to, I saw many of you guys probably at the OECN United Conference, but I wanted to show you where you can find those materials if you didn't attend. So, because we presented the employee workflows and the requisition workflows. So on this meetings and trainings page, you can find the year-end materials and the training materials. And right down below here, there is miscellaneous training presentations and the PowerPoints that we used. So if you click on that, you can see the two PowerPoints that we recently did at the United Conference. So those are accessible to you guys. We'll go back to the, and then you'll find the recaps at the bottom. And we're going to be going over March. I'm kind of stalling as people are joining. So we're going to be going over March. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with USAS, where we had two regular releases in March and then two hot fixes in March. So in March, the performance of the CAN budget report was improved. So, sorry, love that sunshine, but it was blinding me. The CAN budget summary report that you can find under the report menu has been improved. At the average improvement was 73% when generating this with this check marked, exclude accounts with zero amounts. And then with no parameter selected, it was uh, the average improvement was 35%. There will be more improvements as um, we continue to work and improve. And I believe, did it say at the release of the account archive feature, when that's released, the budget summary canned report should also be improved as well. We also corrected the ability to share the report link while having the user that's trying to view the report still authenticate before viewing the report. So in February, uh, one of the releases broke that ability. So this hotfix in March reverted those changes. So what that means is any links that were created prior to that February release were, will work again how they did previously. So the user would have to authenticate before viewing the report. And then if you had any report links that were recreated with that uh, token, that PAT token, those would need to be regenerated again to work the same as it did before. But I'm sure you guys have done that already for those who have noticed that. And then just a note that those, uh, when you create a report link that includes a user token, that that is actually like, like a password. It's the authentication. So you want to be mindful when you're sharing that. Or not be mindful not to share that. We also had an improvement to view the account code at the activity level. So let me go in there. On here, if you click on the more button, you can find this under the account. So you see the different uh, account pieces that you can now get onto your grid as well as to be filtered and create a report. 
So I showed on the recap page, like an example of the fun function and object being pulled on into the report generated from your, re your grid results. And then we had an update to the 10, 1099 correction procedures so that both the ITCs and the districts can submit corrections as well as printing the type two corrections. Amanda did a Fiscal with Friday session on March 8th, and I linked the session here if you wanted to review those changes. Another improvement, we implemented the ability to use the PO repair option to remove the vendor, resulting in, a, so that you can change it from a vendor PO to a non-vendor PO. So, and this would be the, confirmation that would pop up, but let me go in there and say this TARDA bus line, or did I have one that I was going to choose? We'll just use this uh, Dick Sporting Goods. Oh, sorry. That's what why it didn't look good. I was on the wrong grid. I need to be on the purchase order grid to repair the PO. And this PO for TARDA bus line, if I view it, say I'm not sure we're actually going to take that or get those bus tokens from TARDA, I can make it a non specific. Uh, or no vendor PO by repairing the PO as long as it's not been paid on. Click in the vendor and then just leaving it blank. So it's going to change from TARDA to nothing. And then it's going to give you that pop-up message. Do you want to continue? And then the change result you can print out if you would like. So it just telling you that it changed from TARDA to non to no vendor. Now, if you had, if I had invoices created and they were sitting in payables, that would be updated as well. But the PO just can't have been paid on. And notice I used a forget which PO it was, but I used a, a PO that was in March and we're in April and I forgot to show you, but my posting period, that's the advantage of PO repair is that you can repair a PO that hasn't been paid on even when the posting period was closed. So that was a nice improvement with the PO option to remove the vendor if necessary on a vendor specific PO. Another improvement was like when you create test instances, they will now include the SSDT roles. I guess previously they did not. And then back pipe off popular demand. <laughs> These menu options have been re-implemented. So under the periodic menu, you can find the assistant federal assistant summary and the federal assistant detail, even from last year. So those can be utilized as the user wish, would like. Any questions on any of the USAS releases or issues? Pat, there are a couple questions in the chat for you. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Yeah, if it's been invoiced, you could re remove the vendor. Oh, okay. And the PO does not need to be in an open period. So let's take another one because I showed you March was closed and we'll ch choose a March purchase order. I'm not sure if it's been invoiced yet. It has not. 
So let me invoice it. The key here is as long as it hasn't been paid, but it should work as the invoice has been created and sitting in the payable grid. So that's been, it is now in payables. Eighty six. Okay. And now I'm going to go back to Oh, sorry, that was the PO number. So it's a PO in March, repair, vendor. It's gonna go from band for dance to nothing. There's the print result, there's the result. And then when we go back to payables, Pat, that would make sense because you'd need a vendor on the invoice. That's true, true. And then if you needed to update it here, you could delete it or change the vendor. Any other questions? All right, I will hand it over to Lori to cover the USPS releases. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the payroll side of things. Um, we had two regular releases and then one hot fix. So we'll cover um, everything that pertains to um, those three releases on the payroll side. Um, the first uh, bug fix that um, I wanna talk about is the, um, the fix to onboarding. Um, there was a problem with onboarding um, and um, the program itself handling um, custom fields correctly. Um, so there were cases where even property names were being changed. Um, so now the onboarding you know, process will take into consideration um, those custom field changes and um, users should be able to you know, enter employees and go through the, that process um, air-free. Um, the next um, change that was made was to the code program. So under core, if you went to code and you created a new code, um, that code was actually still modifiable after it was saved. So, you know, after you save something, um, it really should just be read only. Um, and then you have to click the edit option to actually go into that um, record and, and do something with it. Um, so now, um, you know, that will work um, as all other records that have been saved um, and you would have to actually click the edit option to go in and make changes to that um, record. Um, next, there was a database connection leak um, between um, on the ACH and the HSA report queries that was corrected. Um, again, this is kind of a behind the scenes um, 
thing, nothing that users would have ever noticed. Um, so that was fixed. And because these two programs are used so, you know, not on a daily basis, um, you know, we didn't have reports of this or anything. It was just something that our developers noticed and um, fixed. Um, moving on to the next bug fix, we actually updated um, our W-2 submission process slightly to remove the a validation um, on that location address um, field. So we had reports of, um, it, it really came into us through um, districts creating their CCA submission file and um, you know something needed to be entered in that location address field. Um, and after looking at the EFW2 specifications, um, it was decided for those districts who are submitting their own files that this is not required. So that validation or requirement was lifted for all of the W-2 submission files, not just for CCA, for those districts that are submitting their own files. So again, just to point out what is determining, you know, what the system is looking at to know whether that field should be um, entered or not. You know, if you go to um, system configuration, under W-2 configuration, I'm sure you all remember, you know, W-2 time wasn't too far in our rear view mirror. Um, this checkbox here that says the district will submit their own W-2 files. If this box is checked, then these fields in both the company and the submitter location address, those do not, they are not required. And the system will now, you know, look at how this box is checked or unchecked to determine whether those fields need to be, um, something needs to be entered in those or, um, you know, it can be missed. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the next um, bug fix, as Pat mentioned, um, on the USAS side, the ability to share the report link um, and still making that be authenticated. Um, we also implemented that same logic on the payroll side. Um, so, you know, those are one of those things that are shared in what we call common. So um, that fix was made on both the USAS and the payroll side to work the same. Next, um, we've had some, you know, um, pain points, I guess you could say, with the absence and attendance import um, option. And we've tried to work through those with, you know, you um, in your district's, you know, issues as they've come in. Um, and one um, way to kind of help the, the frustration with the process and maybe those files not getting loaded as expected or it gets, you know, um, interrupted for some reason and, you know, everything it does not get posted um, is actually changing the way those files are processed. So before the update, the CSV file was actually processed while the file was actually loaded or being, you know, uploaded. Now, instead, um, the file will be uploaded. And then once the upload completes, then the processing of those, um, you know, the lines, the information in that file actually takes place. So instead of it being kind of a one step, you know, the program um, processing that all in one step, it's actually taking you know, splitting that out and, and doing that in two steps to hopefully take away some of that, um, those problems that, you know, your districts have encountered. Um, next, we um, actually removed an obsolete error um, that isn't relevant anymore. Um, it referred to legacy compensations um, and you know, as we, we all can celebrate now, we really probably shouldn't have to be worrying about legacy compensations at this point. Um, so the error that may some of you may have encountered um, when payrolls were initialized and then it was um, listed on the error report um, that pertains to 
payable units being um, adjusted to match remaining workdays. Um, and this, again, it pertained to legacy compensations and how we had to um, take those into consideration when districts were migrating. That's a thing of the past. So um, the, the warning itself is, is no longer relevant. So districts should no longer see that. We've you know removed it from the documentation um, and so forth. So one less error to, to worry about, right? <laughs> um, and then the hot fix that went out, um, we did have reports after our 2024.4.0 um, release went out that users were receiving kind of a, an unusual error that there were not enough pay accounts to distribute charges. Um, and, you know, he reached out to us and said, I'm not sure what's going on. Nothing's changed. These are the pay accounts, you know, have been in place since the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, you know, not sure what's going on. And it did have to go, have um, to do with um, uh, an issue that went out on that prior release. So our developers worked quickly to, to get that resolved. And I think, you know, by lunchtime of, of that Monday, um, you know, it was corrected and um, we didn't hear any other reports of that after the hotfix went out. So again, we apologize for, you know, that, that morning of probably panic from your districts and um, <laughs> when they're trying to initialize their payroll first thing in the morning and those kind of issues happen. It's, it's not a, the best day, the best uh, way to start your day. So we apologize for that. Um, moving on to the improvements, um, we did cor uh, correct a spelling um, in the employee screen. Um, in particular, the drop downs for the ECE qualification option. The word development was spelled incorrectly um, multiple times. Um, that's, you know, it, it's it's a, a word that's involved in multiple options in that drop down. So the spelling and development was corrected anywhere that was not spelled correctly. Um, again, talking, you know, back to the attendance absence import option and trying to improve ways to make that a little um, less painful for districts. Um, we now have um, enhanced the option to once the import option is selected, that button is ap actually disabled. So this hopefully will prevent um, users from double clicking or being, you know, having the ability to double click this option and cause, um, you know, further problems. We had several or a few op uh, enhancements made to the compensation UI. Um, and I've tried to you know, list the screenshots here. Um, the first being um, when now when you click on the X or you hover over the X, I should say, that tool tip that pops up um, should now say archived instead of deleted. So, you know, we, um, if I go to compensation, we really are are rarely ever deleting anything. Um, it's it's archived, so that really wasn't um, probably the best tooltip. Um, so that has now been um, changed to archive instead of deleted to to make it truly mean you know what the this program is doing. The next enhancement um, is you may have noticed that there's a couple areas in um, the compensation screen that, that changed, um, kind of regrouping things, so to speak. Um, one was in the um, old historical context area. That now has been renamed to be more meaningful. Um, contract change history is now what um, you know that header says. And then we've now um, broken out the calendar dates, so that start and stop date, those fields are now um, in a section by itself and under the header calendar date. 
So if I go back to, I should have stayed in there, sorry. Back to this compensation, you can see now if I scroll down, um, this contract cha change history section um, has been renamed. And then the start and stop dates for the calendar um, dates are in a section by itself. Okay, hopefully that makes it a little more clear and a little more easy to, you know, find those dates, um, making them separated like that. All right. Um, the employee dashboard um, had a couple changes. One is to now display um, the suffix. So if an employee has a suffix attached to their name, that will now display um, both in the search option as well as on the employee dashboard. So if I go and I search my employee, you can see now that, you know, this displays. So if you have, you know, two employees with the same name, but maybe one senior and one's junior, or one doesn't have a suffix and one does, um, you can differentiate those in the employee search option, as well as it's displayed on the employee dashboard um, in the employee area um, here as well, just to make sure that, you know, you have the right employee and clear up any confusion. <coughs> also, um, the payments option um, was enhanced. So the grid now sorts um, ascending or the um, most recent payments first, you know, and then on down to, um, you know, the the oldest payments. So by default, that's, you know, always going to sort that way. I know there was some cute confusion at times with payments that may have, you know, been more recent and we would get reports that those payments were missing. Um, and in fact, it was just simply the sort um, on the pay date wasn't working quite correctly. So they may have been intermixed, you know, on down the, the line somewhere here. And if you just sorted that, click the sort date, or I'm sorry, the pay date um, header, you know, once to sort it, um, and then maybe again to, to resort those ascending, um, you would see those payments, you know, in the list as they should be listed. Um, but that did cause um, some confusion. So um, hopefully now, They'll be listed, you know, as you as the users expect those to be, and um, there won't be any missed payments, so to speak. Um, the uh, ACH submission and um, the the generate report and the generate submission file on both of the ACH submission and the HSA submission um, was just moved to the bottom left of the screen just to make it a little more um, clear and, you know, sort of make it in line with where our other report and submission file options are. So instead of it being intermixed um, throughout the, the, the options above, it's now, you know, in the far left corner. And, you know, again, that's just kind of follows the same pattern as any other report option or um, generate submission option. Um, when it comes to new contract, we added a new um, warning. Um, and that warning, I think, you know, is going to be super helpful as we, you know, gearing up for that new contract time of year. Um, we had reports, believe it or not, that um, districts were questioning um, the payment um, that an employee was being paid um, and that paper period being incorrect. And what was happening is um, when the new contract was entered, you have to hit that calculate button in order for the new contract to recalculate or calculate those new figures. So instead of um, you know entering the information in new contract, and then clicking that calculate option, they were entering the new information and then just saving the record. So new contract is not going to change anything until that calculate option is actually clicked. 
Um, and then, you know, you can save the information once you've double checked that and then activate the, the new contract. So that step, that calculate step was getting missed sometimes. And then the, unfortunately the employee was then paid the incorrect pay per period until, you know, it was caught, um, you know, by the, the district user. So now instead, if I would um, enter something different in this paper period than what the system is calculated, it's going to flag a, a warning. Um, even if I don't hit the calculate button and I just skip that step and go and click save. So we can see here, I'm going to cl click the calculate option just so we can see that, you know, yes, the, the paper period should be, you know, $2,115.38. If I would enter something different, so let's just make it $2,500, and I'm not gonna hit calculate, that's the step that some um, district users were missing, and I click save, it's gonna give me this warning here, and it says the paper period entered amount does not match the amount calculated by the system. So hopefully this is gonna prevent that, you know, even if they miss that step, um, it's gonna catch, you know, alert them that, hey, there might be something wrong with that paper period. And, you know, if something's not, if it's not looked at, it's just, you know, uh, that new contract's activated and paid, it, it's probably gonna be paid incorrectly, okay? So hopefully that'll help clear up that confusion and um, districts, you know, paying the incorrect amount. All right, um, we did have some um, improved styling and basically what that means, anytime you see, you know, the styling has been improved, um, that just means that um, the font size for those reports should not randomly change. You know, I know that there's, you've all probably reported, you know, the, the font size for a district when they run certain reports just randomly um, changes and so our developers are actually going report by report and making sure they're setting you know some parameters in the the coding side of things um so that that doesn't happen so the latest reports um that they've made the changes to and improve that styling um, are the attendance report um the abs 103 report and then the employee master report so they're going to continue. They literally have issues for every single report um, to go through and improve that styling on every report possible so that users don't encounter that font size changing in it. You know, it is frustrating because they they don't understand why it's happening. Um, you know, why reports are printing on, you know, more pages than what they they normally do and, and so forth. So we understand that and we're going to, you know, make sure that each and every report is set in a way that, you know, that's not going to happen. All right, that is our improvements. And then lastly, we had a couple new features. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one was to uh, implement the user token for report links, just as USAS already has. So we now have the ability to use those user tokens um, for report links on the payroll side, um, just like USAS has. And then lastly, you may have noticed um, that the employee dashboard, um, you know, looks just a little different um, in the fact that we've added um, a new option called accumulations. So prior accumulations was just lumped into the leaves option. And now we can actually, you know, we've broken that out. And those are two separate options when you um, go to an employee's uh, dashboard. So I can show you here. I'm sure you've all noticed. So now when I go to leaves, that's all it is, um, is just an employee's leave um, screen. If I click on accumulations, um, while it does, you know, it deals with an employee's leaves, this is just their accumulations, okay? So it helps 
maybe see that a little clearer and not have to, um, you know, click on a tab within leaves. Okay. All right. Um, those are our new features. And then last was just a patch that was written um, basically to detect if there were any um, database um, foreign keys missing. Um, so this is, you know, something that the developers wrote um, and that was just, you know, included in um, the release. So um, that patch was, you know, included in and, and, and could be run as part of the release. Are there any questions on anything that we talked about as far as payroll goes? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop sharing then and pass it on to Pat to finish up with um, inventory. Okay. The inventory releases. We had one release in March. Um, it, it included a correction to the split item numbering process. Previously, the tags that had like alphanumeric characters were excluding the zeros when numbering the tags. Also, there was a rounding error with the split item, even when the split item had uneven amounts and that led to the original cost being in, incorrect because of the rounding error and that has been corrected. And then the split item view that the user sees, I'm gonna log in, has been improved. Um, so if I go into this item, it has 12 items and I wanna split it. I would click that. I'm gonna just keep it simple and split it into two. When I edit it, now you can see the original cost grayed out. It's read only, but it's visible. And then on each detail of the split, you can see the original cost read only. And then it also reflects the number of items, the total cost, so it should just balance out. So that's now available for the user to see. And I guess that is, That is all the improvements that were made on the inventory release. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Would you like to share the screen, Michelle? Yes, I would. Go okay. ahead. Good Thanks, morning, everybody. everybody. You guys can see the screen okay. I just have a listing of our upcoming training sessions. Um, next week, we do have an inventory overview. Um, I'll be covering um, the uh, transaction processing on the first day, um, reports on the second day, and depreciation calculation. And I should add in there um, migration um, uh, options um, available. So meaning, um, we should, really should call it uh, migration anymore. Everyone's migrated, but the non-migration steps for those uh, districts that start new in inventory, we're just going to go over those steps um, because you know you guys may encounter new districts or districts that want to start in inventory that didn't migrate over, never used classic, and want to start in inventory. So um, we'll cover those in on that third day. Um, so that's next week, and that will round out our overview sessions um, for the year. 
And then uh, one thing I wanted to point out is um, I did cancel the April 19th employee self-service. I got a little overzealous with, with the training, um, scheduling those. Um, we have one on the 19th and we have one on the 26th. So um, they're making, you know, continual improvements and updates and changes in the uh, beta version right now. So uh, we're going to hold off and just hold one session in April, um, April 26th. So I did send out an email message uh, to those of you that signed up for the 19th, just letting you know that it's been canceled. So please sign up for the April 26th one. And just a note, this is going to be an overview. This isn't going to be an in-depth training because things are constantly changing. Um, and so I think down in, um, we may hold another one in, in May. I'm not quite sure. I'm kind of just waiting to see, you know, where we're at with the early access. I don't have any information on when early access um, will be uh, available. So um, um, I don't have like a date for sure. Um, but, you know, if when we need to hold any trainings on employee self-service, we will. Uh, but for now, you know, that April 26th is just going to be um, an actual, just an overview, just basically the demo that uh, Matt did, but a little bit more in depth because there have been so many changes um, since then. Will there be something we can show um, districts? Um, what I'm thinking about, Amanda, is I think I'm going to, in the newsletter, the April newsletter, we are going to do a feature article on employee self-service, and we're going to provide a little demo um, that they can link, or like a demo recording, um, and they can click on that and see, you know, the progress that we've made so far. And so it won't be a very long one, but it'll just be something that um, that they can view. Um, in regards to, um, yeah, I, I was hoping that maybe that would be helpful just so your districts have an idea, one of, you know, what's going on with ESS, so we want to get the word out, and also just be able to see it at least, um, maybe focus more on this is what you're going to do when you need to create a leave request, you know, and this is how you view your leave request, just stuff like that, very basic, just so they get um, a little better, you know, familiar with um what it looks like. And it does look, you know, similar to what Kiosk did. Um, so the format, but um, a lot more flexibility and just easy to maneuver around um, ESS. So yes, we will do that on April 26th. And then just a little note here, um, April 23rd, 24th, 25th, we're going on the road. Amanda and Lori will be out there and I'll click over to our spring SSD direct sessions. Um, so on the 23rd, they'll be at uh, Meta Marion location, um, Access on the 24th, and Neonet on the 25th. So again, we appreciate you ITCs that are hosting. Thank you so much. Um, if you've got districts, any of you have districts that are close to those locations, um, please have them sign up for these sessions. Uh, the one session that is full, is the payroll session at Neonet on the 25th in the afternoon. Do USAS uh, session in the morning and a payroll session in the afternoon for each location. Um, but, you know, just uh, spread the word that uh, we still have um, openings um, in those locations, except for that PM session on the 25th. Um, so direct your uh, districts to this um, website here and they can sign up for those. And also just uh, um, looking um, in the future here um, with the, um, uh, in May, we do have a, um, our US our fiscal year in reviews. We changed it a little bit this year. Um, we're not putting it all together in one morning. It's a lot. That's a lot for uh, you guys to absorb, you know, listening to USAS payroll and inventory fiscal year and closing. So we're breaking them up. We're breaking them up at fiscal year end and at calendar year end. So in May, um, May 10th, we'll be doing um, USAS and inventory review. And then on May 20 or May 17th, we'll be doing payroll fiscal year end review. So that way you guys can just put on you know, your your payroll hats on that 17th and just focus on that. 
And then obviously on the tech, uh, we'll be focusing on use as an inventory. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, so we so appreciate um, you guys being on the call today. If you have any questions, please reach out. And you guys all have a great weekend. Thank you.